All right. Um, good afternoon and good evening, uh, friends and associates. Um, welcome to this special of Lucy's Children. Um, I am um, giving this platform to Dr. Robert Fully Love, who is someone I have known for quite a spell. As you know, he's the Associate Dean at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. He's got a very long title here, Professor of Sociomedical Sciences at Columbia University Medical Center. Um, to put it mildly, Bob has put his um, thinking and being in a number of places for a number of years, looking at various levels of community health and how to, in fact, help us do a lot better in our health uh, services and health responses then we have, uh, well, as you can see, the current crisis. So I don't need to be more explanatory than that. So with this, I would like to say welcome, uh, Dr. Bob. Uh, we are glad to have you and uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be here, especially at this moment in American history, because talking about the history of epidemics and pandemics in the world, there's a way of anticipating what I think the next couple of decades are going to bring here, not just in the United States, but in the world. Epidemics have the ability to change the course of history. There's no question that that's exactly what we're observing right now. And because there's so much about the control of epidemics that depends on the science of public health, the fact that this epidemic, this pandemic, has become the object of political debate not just scientific debate, has meant that the usual ways in which we control outbreaks that cause harm to the health of the public simply aren't as available to us as they used to be. That's why I'm really happy to be able to chat with you all because so much of what has to occur if we're to ever get on top of this pandemic depends a lot on people sort of understanding what it is that we're facing that they understand something about why history tells us this is a particularly difficult task and why more than anything else, being armed with correct facts about what's happening and why is probably still the best armament that we'll have to maintain something in the way of appropriate levels of public health for the years to come. So with all that, I wanna use a tactic that is so much a part of higher education these days. I'm gonna do a lecture using PowerPoint. So I think some of you are probably already been about webinars where this has become standard, but I'm just sort of letting you know that depending on how this is framed by this particular Zoom network, you might see me disappear for a while and what you're gonna basically be faced with are a bunch of slides. So let's start. All right, so maybe the most important thing to point out is that I'm not simply using this as an opportunity to do a little bit of public health education. I have a career in public health that began in 1986 when I became heavily engaged with my then wife, Mindy Thompson Fullerlove, in the viral pandemic of the 20th and 21st centuries, HIV AIDS. I had a lot of experience doing research in communities that were hard hit by this pandemic. I served on a number of federal advisory committees that looked at how to guide the country's response to HIV AIDS. And much of what I'm doing now is extending the kinds of things I learned 35 years ago to help us sort of understand the nature of the challenge that's facing the planet, not just the United States, at this particular moment. So the way to sort of think about this is to focus on amongst others, how much we're really dealing with a natural phenomenon. The slide basically makes one simple point. Human beings have always existed in a world that was surrounded by microbes. Microorganisms that have the capacity to create illness has been a part of human existence since the dawn of time. What change the nature of this relationship between individuals and the bugs that are around us has everything to do with civilization. The minute we started 
as a species to group together and use the power of our social organizations to transform the planet, we also provided a platform for Mother Nature to do a little population checking by making sure that there would be periodic points in time when a mass epidemic that would kill many people would do a variety of things to level the size of the population and alter the course of human history. A lot of what I wanna talk about as a prelude to talking about COVID-19 is to sort of look at this past history because I am one of those people who believes that the more we know about the past, the better armed we are for the present and for the future. Maybe the most important thing about this work is to understand what it is we're talking about. Words like epidemic and pandemic get used a great deal. And sometimes it's really useful to be clear about how they differ. As the slide points out, an epidemic is an outbreak of a contagious disease condition that causes massive unanticipated increases in illness and a substantial loss of life. What we use in public health to describe this is that we will see a sudden sharp change in rates of morbidity and mortality, and they will be widespread. They will not be concentrated in just one area. A pandemic is an epidemic that has become literally planet-wide, where the presence of people sick with a particular microbe indicates that wherever you look, you're gonna find somebody who's struggling with this particular illness. Pandemics are epidemics on steroids. I think it's important to point out that when we talk about history, we're talking about something that goes back as far as our ability to record things that have been so influential in human life. So maybe the most well-developed description of plagues, the ancient term for epidemics, was the one that comes down from 541 when in the Roman Empire, the Justinian plague over a 200 year period substantially leveled the size of the population in Western Europe. 26 million people basically lost their lives as a result of this epidemic condition over the course of two centuries. And it is thought that these epidemics had a substantial impact on the creation of Christianity as a dominant religion in the world from basically the sixth century all the way to the 15th century. And when in the 13th and 14th century, bubonic plague shows up, you suddenly have a pandemic that not only kills roughly one third of the population of Western Europe, it also creates a period of such uncertainty and such doubt. The Catholic church could not pray its way out of bubonic plague and doubts began to service in human populations about whether or not the Catholic Church was actually able to do the work through prayer that would keep human populations safe. This questioning of the authority and the power of the church comes about because of the massive loss of life associated with bubonic plague. And it has a great deal to do with the enlightenment and a great deal to do with the rise of Protestant sects as a rival religious organization of Christian life. Again, the idea that the enlightenment literally is a function of years of living with pandemic conditions makes us understand why the period we're in right now is so important for the continuation of civilization as we know it in this particular form. More about that in a minute. Bubonic plague, as is pointed out here, had an impact in a wide variety of ways. As is noted here, England and France in the period that the plague raged basically had to suspend the war that was raging between those two nations. During that period of time, the British feudal system collapsed because the peasants who were supposed to work the land, the peasants who kept the, the uh, monarchy in place simply died out in such significant numbers that you couldn't organize agriculture in the same way that you had in the past. Economic relationships between peasants, artisans, and those in the upper classes changed dramatically. And once again, this massive loss of life in the community 
changes so much of the social organization that was present in Europe at this time that the economic structure of what was present in that moment in history also alters dramatically as well. But maybe the most important thing I think for folk who are students of early life here in the Americas is the notion that long before Christopher Columbus arrived on the shores of the Caribbean, Vikings had done a substantial amount of exploration in Northern America, especially around areas like Nova Scotia. There is a lot to suggest that the very robust civilization that the Vikings had maintained would have easily become a dominant factor in life in the hemisphere that we're in now, would have easily dominated what we now see as the Americas. But losses of population associated with the bubonic plague meant that they simply didn't have the person power to maintain the power over their desire to conquest the world as they knew it. The ravaged populations in Greenland uh, basically meant that instead of having a Europe that would be, excuse me, the Americas dominated by Northern Europe, you had a very different system arise altogether. Moving up to modern times, this is something that touches very close to my life. It has everything to do with the Spanish flu. As the slide points out, this was the first of three viral pandemics in the 20th and 21st centuries. A lot of people have talked about Spanish flu. They've compared what we're doing with COVID-19 to the Spanish flu pandemic, pointing out that almost 100 years later, we're seeing similar kinds of conditions. That particular pandemic in 1918 killed 50 million people worldwide. Some folks would estimate would come up with an estimate that's actually larger. The number of dead probably isn't as important as the simple fact that the demographic changes that occur with that level of loss of life had a great deal to do with entering World War I. It's also the case that, at least in my experience, these days in the year 2021 basically have a strong link with how Spanish flu becomes HIV AIDS and how HIV AIDS becomes COVID-19. We are looking at three different microbes. We are looking at viruses, but we're not looking at the same virus. What we're looking at is how important and how powerful viruses are at exploiting many of the social features that construct the life that we know our interactions with each other, the ways in which we move and circulate are all ways in which viral epidemics have basically dominated much of our concerns with public health at this point in the 20th and 21st centuries. I have personal connections to this. And sometimes it's, it's a useful way of talking about why I'm so involved in thinking about pandemics and their control. It's because of this. This is my grandfather. Robert Elliott Fully Love Sr. was born in Mississippi as the son of slaves in 1882. He goes to Meharry Medical College and graduates in 1907 and begins a practice in the state of Mississippi that extends until his death in 1961. I don't think I have to tell this audience what it meant to be a physician in Mississippi at the dawn of the 20th century. My grandfather's practice was dominated by what you see in signs like this. Having myself been born in Louisiana in 1944 as a, as a person who uh, has strong links to New Orleans, many of you are aware of how much life in that period of time and growing up in that period of time was all about orienting yourself by looking at signs that look like this. And we're not just looking at how people moved through space. We're also looking at, in the state of Mississippi, their access to healthcare. That highly segregated state basically made it almost impossible for any African-American who became ill to have the benefits of modern medicine. My grandfather was the medical director 
of this hospital that you see pictured in this slide. The Afro-American Sons and Daughters Hospital was basically something that grew out of insurance that was given to African-Americans in Mississippi at the dawn of the 20th century, where for a nickel a week, you could not only have insurance, you had barely insurance and access to these facilities. Doesn't look like much, looks like a ranch house, but it was only one of three such facilities serving African-Americans in that whole state. And it's important because that was the basis for the fact that my grandfather was heavily involved in dealing with Spanish flu in the Mississippi Delta in 1918. It killed my grandmother. My father became a doctor in large measure, I believe, because his father, a physician, wasn't able to save his mother. This little uh, swatch that you see before you is from an oral history that my aunt, Dr. Daisy Fully Love Balsley, wrote for the Yazoo City, Mississippi Library in 1980. It describes in 26 pages, the life of my grandfather as a physician working in segregated Mississippi, but it has a brief passage that touches upon Spanish flu. During the very terrible epidemic of the flu that claimed my mother's life, my father spent three days and nights going from one plantation to another without going home at all. He would finish at one house where all the members were down with the flu and there would be somebody waiting there to take him to another house where all the members were sick. And surprisingly enough, although we had it, she died of it and he never contracted it at all. I stumbled upon this last year and my father never told me that he, my aunt and my uncle had all been infected with the Spanish flu, but they'd survived. I knew that it had killed my grandmother. And I knew as somebody who grew up in a community where everybody had access to their grandparents, that this set me apart in many ways. But in thinking about where we are now, it's really important to sort of understand why in beginning with the focus on the plague of 1918, we get reminded of how much race and place are hugely implicated in the pandemic we're living with now with COVID-19. What's the most important characteristic of this pandemic? The slide suggests it's the geography. In the early months of the pandemic, cases and deaths were heavily concentrated in the metropolitan areas of New York, New Orleans, Boston, and Detroit, with other major cities and surrounding areas also experienced higher death rates than less densely populated parts of the country. Overall, urban areas were initially hit much harder than suburban and rural areas, and more racially and ethnically segregated areas, segregated areas, were hit harder than less racially and ethnically diverse areas. This is from the beginning of the pandemic in April of 2020. Update now to an article that appeared in another scientific journal, The Lancet. And what do Alexander and his colleagues looking at the characteristics of the COVID-19 pandemic have to say? In their study, he writes, this study suggests that racist structures such as residential segregation may play a role in the capacity of blacks in segregated areas to successfully carry out the distancing required to prevent COVID-19 spread. Our research particularly demonstrates that segregation may have an effect on mobility and contribute to, to rates of exposure to and the incidence of COVID-19. Raises a lot of questions, right? This is from a headline, Ju July 10th, 2020. Housing segregation left black Americans more vulnerable to COVID-19. Subheadline, racist World War II housing policy might not sound like it has much to do with the coronavirus, but it does. What are they talking about? Well, very simply, we live in a country that likes to think of itself as a melting pot. In reality, it's much more a tossed salad. If you look at the census, and the ways in which over the course of the 20th century, it has presented a portrait 
of American civilization, what you see is neatly represented in this slide. What are we looking at? We're looking at patterns of segregation that have persisted since the beginning of the 20th century. And if I may read from the report, the basic message here is that whites live in neighborhoods with low minority representation. Blacks and Hispanics live in neighborhoods with high minority representation and relatively few white neighbors. Asians with a much smaller population in most metropolitan regions, nevertheless live in neighborhoods where they are disproportionately represented. However, unlike Blacks and Hispanics, the largest share of Asians' neighbors is non-Hispanic white. We're describing something that creates the most ideal spatial conditions for a pathogen above, like the coronavirus, to spread. And it starts in history with redlining. Many of you are aware of the fact that redlining comes from the 1930s at a point when the government was trying its best to figure out how to reinvigorate economic activity in cities, the Homeowners Loan Corporation sends out a bunch of auditors to over 300 cities in the United States and asks for a review of the ways in which each city is laid out so that places that deserve recommendation for funding and for investment can be separated from areas that are clearly not going to produce very much at all in the way of economic benefit. The problem was, as is noted in the slide, anywhere where African-Americans lived, anywhere where African-Americans lived nearby were colored red to indicate to appraisers that these neighborhoods were too risky to insure mortgages. That pattern of redlining leads to the segregation that I just described in a slide a couple of minutes ago. The degree to which red line neighborhoods have the highest share of black residents, suggesting that the forces that created segregation in the 20th century, not only live with us in the 21st century, they are now the places where you are beginning to see high reservoirs of viral infections. This is not just a function of COVID-19, HIV AIDS has the same patterns. The greater the degree of racial segregation in an urban area, the higher the likelihood that those segregated areas will have high rates of STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, and most especially HIV AIDS. Redline communities basically are the ones that have the comorbid conditions that are associated with hospitalizations and deaths that are a function of COVID-19. The most important social determinant of poor health care and poor access to health care in the United States in general is living in a formerly redlined in community. And the fact that these are the areas that at the beginning of the pandemic had the highest concentration of folks who lived in packed, dense households where social distancing was impossible, likely worked in areas that had greater likelihood of exposure to the public and therefore a greater likelihood of exposure to people who were ill. And patterns of movement back and forth between work, community, and home that undoubtedly contributed to the early impact of COVID-19 in these communities and especially described the huge burden of death and disease that was so much a part of life here in New York last year. The one other fact that can't be ignored is what you see here. We as a nation, as many of you know, have approximately four and a half percent of the world's population. But as a nation, we incarcerate 25% of all the people who are doing time in a prison facility. Put in other ways, of all the places where you are gonna find people doing time behind bars, 25% of that population is gonna be doing that time in a facility here in the United States. And this is what incarceration, what we in public health describe as mass incarceration looks like. Social distancing much? I think as many of you are aware, people in facilities like this in the United States were 5.5 times, times more likely to get COVID-19 infections than were people in the general population 
and they were 3.3 times more likely to die. It would be one thing to suggest that this was a closed system where the virus is contained as a reservoir with nothing escaping. But as has been pointed out by many folk in public health, nothing could be further from the truth. In an article that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, probably the most important scientific out, outlet in the United States, Barsky and college, colleagues basically point out that if you look at COVID-19 and incarceration, the following becomes evident. When applied to the US carceral context, with approximately 2.3 million incarcerated people, 420,000 guards, and 11 million people in and out of jail in any given year, we are looking at churn that results in 55% turnover in the jail population each week, providing a constant supply of people who may not have been previously exposed to the coronavirus and ensuring that carceral and community health are entwined, intertwined. Think about it, red line communities are the ones that have the highest rates of crime. Those are the ones that have the highest police presence. Live in one of those communities and you're much more likely to have an interaction with the police. And the sheer number of those interactions is likely gonna produce more folk doing time in state prisons from those communities than will be the case in other communities in the state. The idea that they are not closed systems. Visitors come in and out. Prison staff go in and out. Folk who are incarcerated or released, <clears throat> if they are in a jail, 54% of the jail population in the United States in any given week is gonna be turning over. And those folks are gonna go back to their communities. And if they have been in a concentrated area of disease, much of the disease spread in the communities to which they return will be a function of our inability to take care of vaccinating, testing, and including preventive measures in carceral populations so that the threat to the general community does not become enhanced. That is exactly what did not happen. And maybe the most important lesson that all of us in public health have come to is an understanding that we have been for a century trying to get people in power to understand how much the poor health of minority communities represents a threat, not just to the people who live there, they represent a threat to the nation as a whole. The most important lesson that you learn from epidemiology is that never under any circumstance do you let a reservoir of infection go untreated and untouched. Failure to test, to vaccinate, and do appropriate public health care in prisons, and failure to do the job of taking care of the health conditions in many poor communities, ultimately provided that coronavirus with a reservoir from which it could escape, dominate much of the patterns of health in the United States over the last year, and contribute to levels of economic chaos that are unprecedented, unprecedented in American history. So I think the most important thing of all is to understand that where we are now comes down to one basic fact. If you are vaccinated, the likelihood that you will become infected the likelihood that an infection of COVID-19 will result in your being hospitalized or being killed goes down dramatically. It does not disappear. There are no measures in medicine and public health that are entirely free of risk. You don't get to play the game that way. For every move that you make to counteract some agent in mother nature's bosom, the greater the likelihood that what you produce that is effective will have some side effects, some kickbacks. But what we're seeing with the vaccines that have been created thus far is that the number of folk who become sick, hospitalized and die has gone down dramatically. And most of the cases that are overwhelming hospital facilities all over the United States are amongst people who've not been vaccinated. 
So the whole notion that you've got something that works and the whole notion that there's all kinds of evidence that really makes it clear, this is happening, this is successful, this is what you wanna to do to control a pandemic. That is the hardest message that in the highly politicized atmosphere that we're breathing right now, that's the hardest message to get out there and to get across. The pandemic has become politicized from conspiracy theories that suggest science and government cannot be trusted and may actually be plotting against you to believe that the vaccine is a tool for spying on the general public or to limit their rights means that more than anything else, we are costing ourselves the lives of many people who could have been saved if a more sane approach to dealing with something that works could have been developed. I think it's important to sort of understand that what you want is to have an informed public that is able to act reasonably in the face of ongoing threats of a pandemic like this one, which is why I really enjoy the opportunity to make presentations like this, because more than anything else, it's not just how do we present the facts. Having given you some glimpse of how to understand pandemics over well, I think this is the point at which questions would be welcome. And I'm looking forward to your comments and uh, your queries. Let me stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Fullerlove. Uh, if anybody has a question and they would like to raise their hand either electronically or manually, you also feel free to put your questions on the chat and we can um, ask those questions as well. Rita? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Robert, who love. Um, my question is, thank you again. My question has to do with um, there are young people that I've spoken to who are cautious or haven't uh, fully received this. Uh, well, they know COVID and they know COVID die, kills you. Um, why hasn't the government uh, approved this, the FDA? And also, uh, some are concerned about their reproductive situation. So how will this affect? So a lot of questions. Let me begin with the last one. Vaccinations are not recommended for women who are pregnant. There are no reported side effects that are of any consequence. And because and this is what I saw in France last week. There are larger numbers of young people being infected, hospitalized, and in mortal conditions than has been the case in the past. We, we believe that what we're looking at is a virus that continues to mutate. It continues to adapt to the general population. And it's now become very clear that what the vaccine is doing isn't a full solution to getting out from under this pandemic. It's not a cure. So what we're talking about is a preventive measure. And a lot of what people are reading into a preventive measure is, oh, what if my chances of dying are really low? And the answer is yes, they really are low. It's not so much that you are very likely if you um, are not careful to get infected with COVID-19 and die. We're not trying to push vaccines because of the high rate of death that's associated with this pandemic. It's higher than what we typically get with the flu. But the real reason we're concerned isn't because people are likely to die in mass. It's that the hospital systems, the healthcare system in the United States is now ground to a halt. You can't get elective surgery. You need a bypass operation for your heart. Maybe you're gonna have to wait because hospitals like Columbia Presbyterian, which is right over there, I live on that campus, is all about COVID-19 treatment and has all hands on deck. So elective surgery, the maintenance of chronic disease conditions like diabetes, hypertension, and especially obesity. Those things have basically been put on hold. And it's the other levels of mortality, the other ways people are gonna die 
that are literally a function of the health system shutting down, that means getting people vaccinated has become intense. The most important thing is that you're also limiting the likelihood that you'll make someone else sick. A lot of people want to play the game of, you know, I don't know what this vaccine is about. It might have side effects. I don't know. I'm going to take a chance that number one, I'm not going to get it. And that if I do get it, it'll just be like a cold. That's the most likely outcome. Two points about that likely outcome. Number one, some of the effects of a COVID-19 infection are long lasting. I have a bunch of my students who were infected with COVID-19 seven months ago and still can't taste anything. They've lost the sense of taste. There are folk who will complain at our age that they have problems with memory that seem to be much more aggregate, aggravated because COVID-19 does settle in the centric, central nervous system. So there are all kinds of post-COVID conditions that aren't bad, meaning you're not going to be in the hospital, you're not going to die, but which are also going to have an ongoing, lingering, chronic effect on the health of Americans. So you're trying to not only save your neighbors, you're not trying to play Russian roulette with your health by thinking that, yeah, I can avoid vaccination and take my chances based on whether or not I'm going to get infected, whether or not if I am infected, I'm going to get really sick, and based on whether or not if I get really sick, am I going to die. Uh, I'm, at 77 years old, very conservative. I think lasting this long and looking this way means I'm supposed to be around for a little while. So, oh, please, I got vaccinated right away. And coming from a family of physicians, I'm, I'm very clear that it's been in my life history to really be very concerned about the way in which this public health move has to be dealt with. And I think we're all aware of the fact if you've got kids, if you've got grandkids, up until this year, they had to be vaccinated in order to go to school. So the last part of the question, why is the FDA being so slow? Well, the following reasons, and I'm not sure that I agree. Number one, we are under an emergency use mandate, which means that there's all kinds of clinical evidence that COVID-19 vaccines are safe and that they work. So pending long examination of data that gets generated, when we look at what happens to people that are vaccinated, will at some point in time give the FDA enough information, enough data to conclude that the emergency use authorization can be suspended and that COVID-19 vaccines are now fully approved, at which point it becomes very possible to have, you can't go to school unless you're vaccinated, you can't go to work in any government facility unless vaccinated, et cetera. It is the natural conservative nature of American government to not move too quickly with doing this. How many of y'all remember polio vaccine in 1955? What happened with that? Do you recall? 200,000 people got an injection of the polio vaccine that had polio in it. About 40,000 people contracted polio, and maybe a couple hundred died. What happened? They had very poor infection control conditions that were present when it was being manufactured. So as a consequence, you had something that worked, but there was ample concern about what happened when in the rush to get it out, the carelessness that was so much a part of the manufacturing project process literally imperiled the lives of many Americans. So the FDA still remembers 1955. I'm betting a whole bunch of folk in general society do not because they haven't been around as long as we have. But there's no question but that some of that being conservative is because people remember 1955 and they say, hey, I'm not gonna do that again especially given the political atmosphere that is present now, where the FDA is being watched very closely and everything about whether or not you get an approval or not has dramatic economic impact. Tune in, film at 11. I don't know how this is gonna work out, but I do believe as the whole Delta situation gets worse, 
of all the COVID-19 infections in the United States are with this variant. The first version of COVID-19 is no longer present. We're not seeing it in any of the tests. We're not seeing it in any of the hospitals. We're not seeing it anywhere. So that's why everything about getting people vaccinated becomes a critical part. And people are right to question whether or not the federal government is unnecessarily dragging its feet because its desire to be careful may be costing people lives. Um, we have a question from Joyce on the chat. Joyce, would you like to ask it yourself or would you like me to? I can do that if you if you don't mind. Yes, please. So my question, and thank you for this service, Dr. Phil Love. Do you think the decrease in population growth uh, of the white sector uh, is causing red states in the United States uh, or Republicans to fear and cooperate with um, objecting, objecting, refusing to vaccinate related to related as a freedom being taken away from them and absolute rightness to win power once the pandemic is over? Yeah, so have we weaponized COVID-19 and have the statistics that I presented suggesting that it substantially impacts minority populations be something that a clever Republican strategist would say, oh, that's interesting. Ooh, we should keep up with this. Because with the concern, and Ms. Polk is very correct to point it out, is that we are rapidly becoming a majority minority nation. This would be one of the ways in which you'd use population control as developed by mother nature to be a force in maintaining some effort to have the political powers that be maintain their control. So I just wanna say that like every conspiracy theory, what makes this one so attractive <laughs> is its plausibility. Because if you match it with what you're seeing in certain states like Florida, like Texas, where there is a real refusal to follow public health mandates despite the degree of science that we says you gotta do this. Yeah, I think, I think people are rightly concerned. And my own conspiracy theory is that the conspiracy theorists have created an atmosphere where something that should work, something that will work, will not be used because people are afraid of it. I think about African-American and Hispanic populations where rates of refusal to get vaccinated are very high, especially amongst the young. When they cite a YouTube video that makes some outrageous claim that the vaccine is this, that, or the other, and they say, that's the reason why I'm not doing this, they're not citing something that came out in a scientific journal. They're not even citing something that was in a newspaper story. They're citing something that you and I can put together with our iPhones. And that that is driving so much of public opinion, that it is pushing so much of public acceptance of these public health measures is absolutely terrifying. And one wants to believe that if there is a way of laying responsibility at the feet of someone or something, there is no question that the early days of the pandemic, when you had the highest office in the land, failing to acknowledge the severity of the threat that we faced, meant that Americans were essentially invited not to take this seriously. That attitude, we don't have to take it that seriously, no matter how scary the headlines, I think is what makes information sessions like this so important. Because I think we have to be guided by something that looks like common sense. And a lot of common sense is basically rooted in science that people have been unfortunately kind of ignoring. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. You know, as I listen to you, your answer, the thought occurred to me as a healthcare provider myself for many years, um, I uh, certainly the first question I had about the virus, if it was designed in a laboratory was whether or not it would genetically target certain cultures on earth, you know, 
uh, yeah, a good time so, to eliminate all black people on the earth completely. So I'm, I'm glad you're raising it that way. We need to be kind of clear about genetics. Uh, number one, uh, there are no genetic markers that separate one race from another race. Thank you. What Thank separates you. us and what establishes our racial identity is what we choose to say we are. You and I could immediately claim I'm Native American. And if that comes down in the census, nobody's going to come to your house, take a blood test to see whether or not that's true. Because there is no genetic marker that sets somebody apart as Native American. If you look at what we're doing when we do um, Ancestry.com, is we're identifying places where your genes have migrated. But maybe in your case, as in mine, they've been all over the place. My mom's people came from Bermuda. I discovered that I have great grandparents who were Chinese. Hey, go figure. More than anything else, black people. Yeah, because we got dark skin and kinky mm -hmm. hair, what have you, we must have genetic markers that set us apart. No. Think about it. Africa as a continent, it's not a country. Too many people treat it like it's a country. Africa as a continent contains the tallest people on the planet and the smallest people on the planet. They may all have black skin, but their diversity is enormous. There is greater diversity within Africa than there is between black people and white people. Because a whole bunch of white people got us in them. They just don't know it. You're smiling and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Good. So, so the idea that somehow or other you can target a virus to become a weapon that seeks out genetic information and says, oh, white person. No, that's not. Black person. I, I mean, make great science fiction, but it's not science fact. It just doesn't, doesn't work that way. So, however, however let, me, let me give you the other part of the argument. Everything that I've said about segregation has everything to do with the nature of the daily exposures you have in life. Black and Hispanic people live in neighborhoods where the level of stress that they go through just being alive is greater than you're gonna see in other communities. That is why in the city of New York, for example, life expectancy rates in neighborhoods where people have the highest income and life expectancy rates in the neighborhoods with folk who have the lowest income can differ by as much as 10 years. That means if you live in an environment that rich people are in, the likelihood that you get the stressful exposure that have so many of us kicking the bucket has gone down immediately and you're gonna live a life that looks more or less like, you know, normal. But if you're in, a, in, an, in an area that is constantly troubled by violence, where for example, kids grow up so accustomed to living in a place where stray bullets may take someone's life, you know that has an impact on the ways in which they will learn in a classroom. All the thing that the mind does to adjust to stress actually can create, this is the theory of epigenetics, an impact on the genetic structure of the person who's exposed to that level of chaos. And that will ultimately produce changes that are long lasting. If there is a way of targeting poor health outcomes to people in a given society, put them in places where they are exposed to stressful conditions, poor access to food and nutrition, little access to opportunities to exercise so that they don't become sedentary. And those things will in and of themselves result in all kinds of big impacts on how many people live and how many people die. That difference is what COVID-19 exploited. If you are obese and you become infected with COVID-19, the higher the level of obesity, the greater the likelihood that you would die. If you live in a food desert, a term that we use to describe a place where you have no access to, for example, green leafy vegetables or fruit, if you're eating fast food 24 seven, if your diet consists of stuff that comes out of a can with a high level of sodium, starch and fat, why are we surprised that so many people in poor communities are overweight or obese and that their overweight and obesity was one of the things that killed them 
in the midst of this pandemic. So the idea that maybe some politician burst in some notion of final solutions would say, how about we withhold efforts to improve health in minority communities? And let's let mother nature run habit for the next couple of weeks and months to see whether or not that doesn't solve some of our population problems. The only problem with that strategy is that you don't contain the pandemic in the communities that you tried to control that the president of the United States, that the prime minister of England could become infected with COVID-19. Donald Trump came very close to dying. He had a very severe case. They put him in the hospital, not just as a protective measure. You will read a lot of diaries from physicians who point out that all the things they did really represent is not having very good respiration, a low rate of oxygenation in the blood, he's obese, da 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 da, -da. yeah, no. But the whole point was, instead of saying, yes, what affects them ultimately affects me, instead of understanding that this was an invitation to change the way in which where you live impacts your health, we made it political. We made it about wearing a mask. We made it about a revocation of your, life, of your rights as set apart in the Constitution and completely lost the opportunity at the moment when the pandemic was raging to do something about the health conditions that were contributing to it. I'm preaching, forgive me, I do that. It was well worth it. <laughs> Dr. Falilov, we have a couple of questions uh, on the chat. The first one is, from your experience, are there effective ways to induce vaccination among the populations that have reason to be suspicious of the government? How can the US amplify voices like yours from the global majority that may not usually be heard? Thank you, very inspiring story about your family. This is from Diane. I, I do have a, uh, an outsized role in helping uh, the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases manage this. I do do a lot of talks like this. Uh, this is not the first time. This is why I'm always happy to be able to show up at a community gathering. Because let me be clear, in my job, the issue isn't can you reach everybody? It's can you reach the right people? If you all talk to your neighbors and to the people that are around you, if you're influential in your family, having given you some information that you can use and rely on is one way in which you do this kind of thing effectively. But I think probably the, the most important answer to the question goes back to the conversation we had about the FDA. If you have FDA approval and it now becomes clear that like measles, mumps, rubella, and polio, every vaccine that everybody in this room has had since day one. If this vaccine becomes like that, then we're in good shape. Um, I, do, I do believe that it will mean that a lot of places, Columbia University is an example, will basically say you can't come to class if you haven't been vaccinated. And you gotta be clear that if you're at this institution, we are gonna test you every 10 days just to make sure that you're okay. A lot of people see that as, oh my God, we're returning to a police state. Images of 1980 and 1984 and George Orwell become prominent. You know, the thought police are looking at you. Are you saying negative things about the vaccine? We are there, aren't we? We're already cutting people out of Twitter if they say stuff that's stupid. I mean, right now I'm happy for that because I want the information to be quashed. But people who are worried about what we're seeing is literally a battle between us and mother nature around one thing. Can human beings control themselves, their attitudes and their behaviors sufficiently to ward off the threat that has been created by this virus? Can we figure out how to basically quell our doubts and do the things that we know are gonna work? Everything that I've said about the FDA means that instead of having people reason their way to a solution, instead of having people make informed choices about what they do for their health, we're basically gonna have the government come in and say, you gotta do this, otherwise you can't work, you can't travel, you can't go into a restaurant, you can't go to the movies, what have you. If we get to that level, we may have done a great deal to quell the pandemic, but I think the collateral damage we will have done to democracy as we know it, I think that's gonna be severe. I don't think we are meant to be 
in a society where in order to keep ourselves healthy, we are relying on government to force us to do the right thing. But that's where we're going. And that's why I think uh, the question of how we make things better is probably a question of, it's going to come down to a mandate. It's going to come down to being required. How are we going to live with that? And how are we going to make that OK enough so that we don't create other problems in an already troubled democracy that will make it that much harder for us to proceed as a nation? Um, the next question is from Dor, which is, please explain why are vaccinated people less likely to spread the virus? OK. And there's a second part to that question that I'll ask after you've replied to this one. I think the biggest thing of all is, how does COVID-19 transmission work? It is not a function of what you touch, because what we know is that in order for an infection to occur after exposure, people have to have had a large amount of virus present in a sneeze, a cough, or in a closed gathering where there's a lot of air that is filled with viral particles. It's the viral charge. How much virus is there? If everybody's clear that more than anything else, we're looking at the higher the concentration of virus, the greater the likelihood, not just of being infected, but the greater the likelihood of transmitting the infection. If we're clear about that as the principle. Here's what you have to know. It's the nose. The symptoms that people get with an initial COVID-19 infection look and feel like a common cold. It is a virus that concentrates on the mucus reasons in the nose. If you have a vaccine that is really impactful, even if you are exposed to the virus, you will not produce enough other than in the nose to infect somebody else. It won't go from your nose to your lungs. It will not have the force of your lungs to drive a cough or a sneeze, sneeze into a machine that carries a lot of virus that can infect us. People with the vaccine, I'm getting internet connection is unstable. I'm hoping it's still making it good. People with the vaccine, even if they become infected, won't produce enough virus in general to impact somebody else. And they won't produce enough virus to have it move to the body systems that are most likely to result in hospitalization and more severe conditions once you're there. So it's everything about how effective this vaccine has become in taking away the volume of virus that is so connected to illness and to death. Um, the next question is, do you think it is a plan to have some people die early to save on social security and Medicare expenses? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, okay. Let me just say that once again, all conspiracy theories have a really solid, I think, foot in the facts. What do we know about COVID-19 mortality? Forget about all the numbers, how many people we're talking. We're not talking about volume. We're talking about what's the structure of that mortality. Answer, roughly 90% of it is mortality that occurs in people who are over the age of 75. So we are looking at a virus that is much more deadly in older populations, much more likely to create hospitalizations in older populations than in younger ones. So it's certainly a major factor <clears throat> in how much we are looking at a variety of different health outcomes created by this pandemic that will have an impact on the demographic structure of the United States. But let's look at some other things. <clears throat> Again, whatever might be happening to thin out the folk who are elderly, all the folk who are gonna die because they don't have access to the usual level of clinical or hospital care, you've got to add that to the number. And how about overdose deaths? One of the biggest impacts of this pandemic has been on the mental health of the American population. Roughly 25% of Americans 
when surveyed are saying that they've had some symptoms of depression since COVID-19 began. For a lot of people who are under that kind of stress, if you're already struggling with an addictive disorder, <clears throat> if you have a substance abuse disorder, being at home, lack of socialization, losing your job, I mean, thinking about all the stresses that people have had to endure, if you're struggling with a substance use problem, this was the sort of stuff that would aggravate it. So we went from 72,000 overdose deaths in 2018 to having more than 90,000 at this point in our history. And almost all of that increase in overdose death is thought to be a function of people isolating themselves as a result of the pandemic. I'm pointing out that as a strategy for winnowing out the population, if we're only concerned with elderly folk, yes, doing very little to control COVID-19 will have an impact on older Americans. Will it have a measurable impact? Well, with one to 2% mortality on a small group, over time, it could become problematic, but it will be offset by all the other mortality that is not associated with COVID-19 infection directly, but has everything to do with how the pandemic has disrupted the system of healthcare in the United States. We keep coming back to the fact that much of public policy is about saving hospitals, not keeping people from dying. Oh, we wanna do that, certainly, but it's how many states now have all their IC units filled to the brim? How many emergency rooms are closing down? How many doctors are leaving medical practice? because conditions are too chaotic. How many community and rural hospitals are closing down because the people who were most likely to be sick were the people who couldn't pay the bill for their hospitalization? The government is not reimbursing hospitals for healthcare. It costs an average of about $70,000 for somebody who's been hospitalized with COVID-19 and who's had to go through intubation to basically survive that stay. <clears throat> so again, what we're looking at is a range of catastrophic conditions that might be focused on COVID-19, but have everything to do with the collateral damage that is increasing with every single day that we are not able to keep this virus under control. Um, the next question is, you use HIV in this discussion about poverty and inequality. However, the homosexual community is economically diverse. What else is your point about here? What changes do you see predict will come about on a sociological standpoint? Can we predict? I have been teaching in prisons in upstate New York since 2010. I'm part of the Bard Prison Initiative. HIV is more present in the nation's prisons than in any other community in this nation. Roughly the rate of HIV infection in prisons is about 1.5%. In the general population it hovers around 18 to 20 per 100,000. You see the difference in scale? Whatever the cause of the infection, whatever the nature of the activity that produced it, the real issue isn't who's to blame, who suffered most, who's in the greatest difficulty, is what is it doing to everything about the manner in which we try to control all the factors in our social environment that expose people to this kind of condition. The biggest issue with HIV for me was never just about drug use or homosexuality. It's that we made a war on drugs beginning in the 1970s that locked up the very population in the 1970s that was much more likely to have been exposed to and infected with HIV than any other. Remember in the 1970s, you had plenty of people in New York City who were in shooting galleries, who were getting access to heroin and cocaine and then injecting it by sharing their needles with other people. And it's the needle sharing that probably had the greatest impact on much of the levels of HIV that we see in the nation's jails and prisons. When we made a war on drugs, instead of deciding that we could have public health and medical solutions to the problems of, addic of, of addiction, 
We turned it over to the cops and to the courts. We created a system that now has 2.2 million people behind bars, has 7 million people in any given year who are on probation, on parole, or under the supervision of the courts. We have almost 100 million Americans who have some kind of contact with the police or the courts that's produced a record about their inactions. And we have a system of incarceration that guarantees that when you leave, you are now a permanent second class citizen who can't vote, can't get a job, can't qualify for housing in many cities, and is going to struggle to get an education. If we think about all of those as being a condition that incarceration exploited, if we're thinking about the fact that the war on drugs drove a great deal of the HIV pandemic, which is now 50% in minority communities, then we begin to understand that while some impacted groups struggle mightily because of the scourge, because of the stigma associated with HIV, from a public health standpoint, it's the absolute awful way in which we've managed public policy the absolute awful way in which we've managed and mismanaged public resources to combat the epidemic. That means that our 40th anniversary of celebrating the, or commemorating rather, the existence of HIV in the United States was June 5th, 2021. It's not just a gay problem, it's become so much more. Um, I'm just going to jump a little bit to questions from people who haven't had a chance to ask a question yet, and then I'm going to return to the other questions. Okay. Um, one of the questions is, what's your opinion on boosters? That, well, well, let's think about this. Every year, everybody in this audience is supposed to get a flu shot. I'm going to bet that you're like Americans. Only 45% of you actually did that. But we get one, oh, bless you, Andrea, I saw you. <laughs> Every year, you're supposed to get one. Uh, whether it's a booster or not, it's the notion that, oh, something new's coming around, better be prepared for it. Hasn't that, that been the lesson with Delta? Think about all the people in Africa and in Asia, less than 1% of whom have been vaccinated. If COVID-19 shows up in any of these regions, it will have a perfect Petri dish to create new variants. Let's be clear, COVID-19 will become endemic. We didn't have the resources to wipe it out because we couldn't vaccinate 70% of the world's population. For every population that is not vaccinated, that becomes a niche that the virus can exploit. And as long as there are new variants circling, we will have to get booster shots. Let's be clear that things like measles and mumps in their origins thousands of years ago were probably fatal. We represent the ancestors of folk who survived that and carried on so that if you are exposed to these things, instead of being fatal, you just get ill and uncomfortable for a couple of days or weeks. Well, COVID-19 is just another way in which Mother Nature is saying, y'all still here? What I gotta do to get rid of you? And to the degree that we are looking at agro-business, viruses begin in bats. The most important change in the nature of the world's forests has been what you're seeing in Brazil and what you're seeing in a lot of places in Eastern Europe, where clearing forest land has put a lot of pressure on the evolutionary conditions in which bats live. There are 1,300 some odd different species of bats and many viruses are basically associated with their <clears throat> their intestinal systems. When you put pressure on their environment, some of the adjustments that they make will influence the nature of the virus that will basically develop on their insides. And a lot of people are saying that COVID-19, the SARS coronaviruses family, represents part of what has happened as global warming continues to change the geography and the nature of the biodiversity that this planet has always had. So instead of having a flu, what we got was COVID. And everybody is kind of clear that that's gonna be driving a lot of what we're gonna be doing in the future. 
thinking about how to have whatever we're doing to contain it in human populations also be a function of what we do in everything related to improving the nature of the environment and doing what we have to do to change the course of climate change. The fires that are going on, the floods that are happening in some parts of the world, the devastating levels of drought that are in other parts of the planet, these are all representations of ways in which as the biosphere, the area in the planet where all animals exist and function, if the biosphere changes because the physical environment changes, the diseases that come from the biosphere will change as well. And the likelihood that they'll be more deadly might in fact be a way in which mother nature says, you know, y'all have done so much to poison this puppy. Maybe the only real solution is to get rid of y'all altogether. And I, I think it's important to point out that since the 1990s, hold on a second, let me see if I can get this. Lori Garrett got a Pulitzer Prize for writing in the 1990s that the coming plague, she anticipated COVID-19. And it's not even that much rocket science. Throughout this century, we've seen more and more viral pandemics. The last two centuries, we've seen more and more viral pandemics. It, I've only talked about the ones that are the biggest hitters, SARS-1, SARS-2, Ebola, uh, avian flu in 1957. No, we, we've been going through mother nature doing her best to sort of juggle what's going on. So rather than think about this as evil politicians, I, I worry that mom nature is saying, saying she's had enough of us and is trying to do her best to, uh, you know, cut us out. Um, we have a question from Joyce and then I think uh, um, we have a question from Laura as well. Um, so from Joyce, do you think reasons for the last 50 years health providers have consistently at 30% of them refused vaccine? level or years of education as two-year nurses are not taught community health until the BSN? You know, uh, having a father, a grandfather, and a wife for 30 years who are physicians, I'm real clear that they're just like the rest of us. Whatever the level of their education, you know, their capacity to just see the world in ways that are really strange and bizarre are not impacted by the level of their education or training. So yes, people come up with all reasons why they don't want to do this. And there's no question that while we would expect and want better from the people who are providing for our health care, in too many instances, that isn't what happens. A lot of the reasons why certain communities are very, very resistant to vaccines isn't so much about vaccines, it's just about the nature of medical care in the country. There are a lot of you who have every reason to not trust doctors and to not trust the health care that you've been getting. And as soon as a person appears on the screen with an MD degree and starts basically making recommendations, in way too many populations, folk will not see a voice of science or reason. They'll see another representation of some jerk who in the course of their medical care was abusive, unresponsive, and basically um, doing more to contribute to your dissatisfaction than to your general health. A lot of minority patients will tell you two things about their experiences with medicine at this point in our history. Number one, you tell the doctor the story of how your condition came about and it becomes immediately clear you're not believed. In other words, your story is going through some kind of filter where it's not so much a collection of facts, it's can I trust you? Can I believe you? Is your word something that I should uh, really pay attention to? Or am I gonna come, go off and have my own notions, my own fantasies about what it is that created this condition? People who have the sense that they're not listened to, that they're not paid attention to, dominate much of the dissatisfaction people have with medicine and with hospital care. 
And then there's the other. If you're black and you have pains, a lot of doctors are trained in medical school with the belief, belief that blacks are more likely to develop a drug addiction, more likely to have a substance abuse disorder than other people. And therefore, they are literally taught to be very careful about how they make recommendations for the use of pain medicine. So you tell the doc it hurts and you need something stronger than bare aspirin. And they say, no, this is going to have to suffice. And it's the sense that not only are you not believed, you are not trusted, you are not thought to be someone who is fully in control of the behaviors that are going to impact your way of dealing with recommended treatment. So in those kinds of settings, when individuals from that culture now become the people who are telling you vaccinations are necessary, you should get vaccinated. A lot of the hesitancy isn't because people know about public health research that was unethical. It's because their ongoing experience of medical care in the United States has made them doubtful the doctors have their best interests at heart. And I think that that's a problem, a big one. Um, there's a question from Kim that will follow up, I think, on this topic as well. But meanwhile, I think Laura had put her, um, her name up for a question. Do you have a question, Laura? Would you unmute, please? Off of this. Wait a second. I'll... You got it. Go ahead. Yeah, I got it. Um, I've encountered a couple of people, um, more than a couple recently, um, millennial age, who have not gotten the COVID um, vaccine. And their rationale is, is because they've heard from so many people that it's caused fertility problems. They haven't gotten their period after they've gotten the infection. Oh, they've had heart problems since that, memory problems. And, you know, and they believe this to be fact. And because they've heard it from a lot of people. I asked them, what was their source? You know, and it's a lot of people. Have you read anything? Well, no, I haven't seen anything written about it. Oh, but no, I've seen this on some news recording. Well, what, you know, and you can't get them to give you any concrete evidence that any of these things are true. What kind of evidence is there that a vaccine has caused any significant side effect um, in any individual? I mean, other than maybe a, a person here or there or a very few number of people given the hundreds of millions of people that have already had the injection. I think you've answered the question. The rates are very low. And I think what we're looking at fundamentally is what you pointed out as the actual cause. It's not the message, it's the messenger. So people are much more willing to be swayed by a really seductive YouTube video than they are by a careful examination of the facts that are available on Google for anybody who wants to look. The numbers are there. It's that people don't want to be guided by those numbers. It's the idea that they believe the numbers come from a biased source, that there is a conspiracy in how the numbers are being generated. You might recall that Donald Trump in May and uh, early June of 2020 didn't want people counting cases because he thought it made him look bad. So everything about the collection of statistics became not about telling us how bad things are. It became part of the political discourse about what are we doing to get rid of Donald Trump. So the trusted source that science is supposed to be now becomes a biased source that has political motives deep at heart. I don't know how you change people's minds if that's the fundamental basis of their belief. Holding up endless statistics that claim to be accurate and came, claim to be from the right source simply will not work because people made it clear, I don't trust that, I don't believe it. And so part of what you said is one of the reasons why I'm here. If people are more moved by word of mouth, and what they hear from others, 
Many of y'all are folk who are looked up to. And when people come to you for advice, they may be more inclined to listen to you than they are to pay attention to something that's in the, something that's in the times. And I see Dar Dottie Zellner is here. So since we go back more than 50 years, I mean, she's one of those people I know. When Dottie speaks, people listen, which is why it's always useful to not simply have scientific articles. It's really good to show up in somebody's uh, living room, even if it's just via Zoom and say, hey, can we talk about this? Because I really do believe at this point in time, it's not enough to cite what's on paper. It's all about what we're able to do, talking to each other, to achieve something that looks like a state of reason. By the way, that was me being optimistic. That was me preaching. Uh, <laughs> that's what you're supposed to say on a, on a Sunday morning. But the truth of the matter is, I think that this is where mother nature wins. Because literally, we will be killed by our own stupidity. You know, and historians from another planet will land and say, you know, they actually had a way to get out of this mess. They just didn't do it. And they didn't do it not because they were restrained. They didn't do it because they didn't believe. Um, Laura, if you're responding, you're muted. Please unmute. Just keep asking, and you know, you want to play Russian roulette. And they say no. And I say, but that's the game you're playing, you know? And and for any 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 possible side effect, it's like point zero 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 one in a population, you know, against the, you know. I don't know how many hundreds of millions of success. So, you know, look at the odds. I mean, and look at, you know, you're smart. How can you be so stupid? I mean, I can't say it any other way. And Thank they you, can Laura. say, yeah, but what if I'm the one person who gets that? And I say, forget it, you know? That, I mean, that, that is also the argument that many of you have heard from people who won't fly. You can tell them that you're much more likely to die in an automobile accident than you are in a plane crash. And they'll be just really clear, look, I can't see how something that heavy is gonna get in the air. And if it's got me in it, I know that just means it's gonna crash. And it's at that point in time that people have made it clear, I'm abandoning all sense of reason. Something else is gonna be guiding me and it's much more primitive. And it's not that that primitive voice can't use the logic of reason to make a case here and there. It's that in the end, convincing them is not because you've got better logic. It's because you've found something about their emotional makeup that makes it possible for them to pay attention. If I knew how to do that, oh man, you know. Um, we have a question from Kim. When we think about the history of medical apartheid and experimental of medical advances on African-Americans from uh, to Kiski, to gynecology, to advances in brain surgery. African Americans couldn't even bury their loved ones without their bodies being stolen for school like John Hopkins. How then do we address this trauma as we, um, as we ask this population to trust the same system? Yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> here's what happens to all of us <clears throat> who are old enough to appreciate that history is actually real. <laughs> that it's worth looking at, that it has things to tell us about where we are now that we need to pay attention to. Uh, so Harriet Washington, I think you're citing stuff from her book on medical apartheid. I mean, that won all kinds of awards because it was a blistering indictment of how since 1619, if you look at the history of the interaction between medical science and slavery, what you saw is a portrait of horror, of degradation, of experimentation. Tuskegee and the syphilis experiment from the 1930s pales in comparison to the abuses that were so much a part of the ways in which medical doctors felt empowered and free to do whatever they wanted with slave populations to test out some theory about medicine and medical care. So, that history does exist. And I think the big thing is, you don't wanna be so mad at that history that it leads you to ignore what are clearly opportunities to take advantage of resources that exist now. You know, <clears throat> the classic expression, and some of you will remember from your youth, I drink the poison and I wait for you to die. 
okay, I'm not going to take your vaccine. I'm not going to go to the hospital. I'm not going to get tested. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in the end, you haven't harmed the person that's created that situation. And you've increased the likelihood that tragic consequences are going to be present. And, and, and again, I'm so aware of how much conversations like this do begin with a real commitment to the idea that reason should govern how we think, should govern how we act, and should govern how we engage in communication with others. But whenever we are faced with that which is non-reason, that is crazy, I mean, forgive me for using, using a crude term, we are often helpless because what we know to do is to continue to push facts and evidence into the face of somebody who's made it clear, I don't care about facts and I don't care about evidence and feel ourselves to be stuck because we're in a situation where we simply can't get off the dime. I, I, I believe that what happens, especially in conversations with young people, literally goes back to some of the oldest principles of community organizing. You gotta be in a setting and a situation long enough so that people will trust you. Your calling card should not be your speech, your script, your language or your ideology. It should be your willingness to be a neighbor who works with the community and as a result of that work becomes trusted so that what you say now has some weight. It has some impact. And too much of what's happened in the US, we're dealing with communities that have been shifting and changing. They've undergone gentrification and displacement so that the kinds of things that you saw in Montgomery in 1955 have disappeared. If you think about what made the Montgomery boys boycott work, it was people feeling so connected to their neighbors and to the outrages that everybody had suffered that they could make common cause for more than a year to put themselves in a situation where they were endangered and deprived, but which they persisted in doing. We keep thinking that some version of that America exists today. We are so many, we are in so many communities where everybody looks the same because they do come from the same racial, cultural background, but they don't know each other. And because they don't know each other, they don't trust each other. And it's one of the reasons why for folk our age, what we've seen more than more in the course of the last 50 years is less of a reliance on the community and on your neighbors and more of a sense that you gotta rely on yourself. All of our self-help books are basically about how much you are the captain of your ship. You control your destiny. So the only thing you have to be concerned about is how you take care of you. The notion that you owe something to the people around you, to your family, to your neighbors, what have you, that's an abstraction. People might say it, but they will not act upon it. And because there's no way in which there are large community conversations amongst trusted messengers, the message that is trying to get through that would change people's thinking and change people's attitudes has too much in the way of barriers. It's just too hard to get through. Once again, facts aren't enough. It's trust, it's belief, it's faith in your neighbors that ultimately makes something like achieving herd immunity possible. And I just worry that we're so far past that in the United States at this point that I'm not that optimistic that some of our public health met methods are gonna succeed until much more folk have been hospitalized. There are much more damaging outcomes associated with this pandemic. So that out of sheer necessity, we'll do what we seem to be unable to do right now. But that's the whole notion that it's bad karma. It's evil intent and it's bad events that are gonna drive us to do the right thing. And that's scary. Um, just a comment that Barbara, who's a member of the Westchester Society, welcome Barbara. Uh, 
Um, Thank you. Would like would like to know if you can present it at Westchester as well. So I will copy this message and put it on an email and send it to you later tonight. We would yes. love you, Doctor. You, you're you're amazing. We have platform Sunday mornings, and I'd like to find out if you're available and what slot we might have for you. You just have to cons kind of um, squeeze the information down because we're on a limited time frame. But Barbara, you're you're so good. Thank you thank, so much. Thank you. I'll make sure that the email carries the information so that you guys can continue this conversation after the wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joyce has another question. Um, do you know if the system that we are considering a playbook to be used in the year 2121, when the next pandemic comes on the scene with rules like laws against political bushwhackers, requirements of vaccination, public requirements? You know, there are all kinds of things that uh, public health policy experts are thinking would be useful. But more than anything else, the idea that there are political consequences behind every decision probably means more than the science that is going to be at the base of uh, some of the recommendations that would be made. Right now, anything that seems to limit the ability of people to speak, to move around, and to enjoy what they see is their right to the life they had before January 2020 means that it's that much harder to sell um, hard times, restrictions, um, fines and impositions on people if they don't do right. I, I think, again, looking at the governors of Florida and Texas, I think people are literally trying to make political hay on how much they are defying many of the mandates that public health has set down <coughs> excuse me, as essential for epidemic control. So one can think about introducing legislation, changes in regulations, changes in the way states overlook so many of the activities related to health and public health. But if they become the target of political opposition, no matter how good they are, no matter how logical they may be, they will not find their way into the public spaces. We're aware of the fact in public health of how many people have resigned from public health positions because politically it's become too hot. If you're a commissioner of health who's had your life threatened because you're trying to get people to wear masks, if you're in a school that has had outbreaks and you're told that if you make people wear masks, you will lose your state funding. Oh man, what, what we can see here is once again, what is at play is stuff that has very little to do with rationality and is much more clouded by the chaotic conditions in American political life. So we're not making judgments based on fact, we're making them based on a whole host of political and ideological considerations. And it's the scariest part of um, what I think I'm seeing in the political horizons at this moment in time. You know, the whole notion that you have a rise in cases in your state, your hospitals are basically overwhelmed. Uh, you're now seeing otherwise uh, preventable mortality starting to rise, and you are still in power, you're not being impeached, you're not being questioned, you're not being recalled. I mean, that's how much you can get a sense of how little impact public health thinking and public health facts are having on so much of the political dynamic that's driving the way the country is being managed. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why at some levels, since a whole bunch of you like me have history as being involved in community organizing and being you know, political when you have to be, in the end, it's less about the science and much more about what we learned about getting communities mobilized and motivated that's gonna count in the end. I want to thank uh, 
Dr. Bob for his illumination and elucidation and illustration, okay, of uh, the current status of things uh, from a long time ago right up to today. Uh, I'd love to have you back at another time, Bob. You're just wonderful, a great speaker. And I'd like to thank all of the rest of you for coming to hear it's words of wisdom. Lucy's children tries to put out as much information as we can, as often as we can about various kinds of things. And obviously this COVID Delta, which is just one of a number of the COVIDs that is just around the corner, okay? It's something that we really need to pay some attention to. And again, thank all of you for coming. Good night.